I was watching a movie that featured an odd character walking the streets of the city carrying a cardboard sign that read, The End is Near. He looked weathered and a little crazy. So, is it crazy to talk about the end of time? Are we on a timeline that's running out? The Bible indicates that the earth as we know it will not last forever. Are you prepared for the end? In this sermon series, John is helping us discover the events described in the Bible that will occur as time runs out. God doesn't want you to face these events in fear, but with a steadfast hope in the saving power of Jesus. You listen as we worship our Savior, followed by today's message from John Hambright. Well, it's good to see you on this very, very special day when we commemorate or start our commemoration of those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. We thank you that you are here to uh, extend <clears throat> our time of thanksgiving to those folks. Uh, I would ask you not only to remember those like the 53,000 that we lost uh, during the Vietnam era, but also to remember those that come back that are not just exactly uh, the way that they were when they left. Sometimes we call it PTSD. Back during the World War II, they called it being shell-shocked. That, that many of those that come back, uh, the amazing rate uh, of suicide among, among those people, uh, I forget how many times greater that it is for war veterans. Uh, also, the fact that some of them just live homelessly and not knowing what else to do. It's just a tragedy. Someone said war is hell. Uh, it's not but it's as close to it as you can ever get. So we want to remember those in prayer as well. I would like to begin this uh, uh, topic of the Great Tribulation with words that was written some time ago uh, that was penned and, and put in a song. It says, I see a bad moon rising. I see trouble on the way. I see earthquakes and lightning. I see those bad times today. I hear hurricanes blowing. I know the end is coming soon. I fear rivers overflowing. I hear the voice of rage and ruin. Hope you got your things together. Hope you are quite prepared to die. Looks like we're in for nasty weather. One eye is taken for an eye. Now if I just handed you those lyrics and you looked at them, you're probably thinking that Somewhere, some, some religious guy sat down and wrote these, and probably some quartet picked it up and began to sing that around in churches somewhere. But really, those lyrics come from John Fogarty, and they were sung by the group uh, Credence Clearwater Revival. They were given to us in, in, in 1969. I probably there isn't a more pagan group running around during that period of time than these folks, but yet they understood something uh, that they did not learn, maybe in a uh, civics class or maybe in a physics class where they were studying thermodynamics, but they learned it from practical experience. Catastrophes and devastation has been a constant companion with us throughout all of written and recorded human history. Natural disasters claim the lives of thousands and thousands of people every year. Truly the words of Job when he said that man who is born of woman is but full of a uh, few days and, and full of trouble. We know that, that these catastrophes will come. Let me cite a few of those for you. In 1902, volcanic action of Mount Pelee erupted in the West Indies, killing 30,000 at one time. On June, uh, January the 24th of 1556, 830,000 died from an earthquake. 600 people were killed in the Iroquois Theater uh, uh, at one time because of a fire. Tornadoes killed 700 people uh, in Illinois and Indiana and Missouri in March of 1925. Famines in 1877 killed nearly one million people in China alone where they starved to death. 
In 1887 in China, floods took 900,000 at one time. Landslides killed 200,000 uh, in 1891. Cyclones, 500,000 in East Pakistan did, died because of a, of a killer water storm. You can, you can see the, the mass natural devastations that come. And, and the point of these gruesome statistics is just to show you that catastrophes, catastrophes and devastation has been a constant companion of mankind. But according to the Bible, there is coming a short period of time in which a calamity is going to come such as never been before or never will be. It is so gruesome and so awesome that Jesus said, except the days be shortened, there would be no flesh saved. This devastation over a seven-year period of time is going to claim more lives than all of these that I've given you as statistical facts as well as all of the other natural disasters that have been put together. Jesus spoke of that in, in Matthew chapter 24 in answer to a question that the disciples asked about what is the sign of your coming and, and when is the end going to be? Jesus began to re reiterate to, to his disciples things that he had told them before but picking up in verse number 21 of, of chapter 24 of the book of Matthew, he says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world, since time, no ever shall be, unless those days been shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We read this passage of Scripture and we understand some interesting facts about the tribulation, the great tribulation. The sureness of that tribulation has been recorded for us in the Bible, in both the Old as well as the New Testament. In the book of Isaiah chapter 13, it says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. The Bible records the sad catastrophes with seven different, excuse me, twelve different phrases. It is called the day of the Lord in 2 Thessalonians. It is called the indignation in Isaiah chapter 26. It is the day of God's vengeance in Isaiah chapter 34. It is the time of Jacob's trouble in Isaiah chapter 30. It is the overspreading of abominations in Daniel chapter 27. It is the time of trouble such as never was in Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 9, it is called the 70th week. In Daniel chapter 12, again, it is called the time of the end. In Revelation chapter 6, it is called the great day of his wrath. It is called in Revelation 14, the hour of his judgment. It is called in Matthew chapter 13, the end of the world. And in Matthew chapter 21, chapter 24, verses 21 and 29, it is called the great tribulation. The word tribulation is an agricultural term. It is used for separating the husk or the outward part of the corn. 
You have probably heard of stone ground meal. Those of us who go to Gatlinburg or to Tennessee have probably went to the old grist mill and, and we looked as, as that old timey machine is used to grind corn and, and we spend our money taking home some stone ground meal. If you have a chance to look on the inside, you see that there are two huge stones that go round and round opposite each other. Corn is fed into those and that, that great wheel that is on the top compresses that and grinds it and grinds it and grinds it and pretty soon trickling out, you see what you and I call cornmeal. Well, that is the imagery of the great tribulation. It comes from the word called philipsis that has to do with this pressing wheel. It has to do with this affliction. It has to do with a burdening, an anguish, a trouble, a binding with oppression. It has to do with just grinding and grinding and grinding till you're nothing but powder in its presence. You understand that that is the term that Jesus uses trying to describe to you what these seven years of horror are going to be like. That's the reason it is called a great tribulation, to separate it from the normal natural disasters or problems that face us in day-to-day -day life. It is a time that is coming such as never been before, and it is the time of the end. It is going to be a finishing up of the great wrath of God. You can understand by reading these passages the seriousness of this tribulation. It is seen in both the Old as well as the New Testament. And the most detailed account of this great tribulation is given to us in a little synopsis form in the book of the Revelation chapter 6. In the book of the Revelation chapter 6, it is going to, to begin a description uh, of, of this great tribulation. It is going to be a time when seals are going to be opened. It is a time when trumpets are going to sound. It is a time when vials are going to be poured out. And this brief picture is given to us that is called or entitled the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Let me start reading in verse number 1 to share with you in chapter 6 uh, about the, the great conflict that is going to come and the great trouble that is going to be on earth. Now, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. This is a revelation of that man of sin, the Antichrist, who is going to come, and he is going to sit upon a white horse like a victor, and he has a bow, and he goes out, and he is going to conquer the world militarily. He is going to conquer the world economically. He is going to conquer the world governmentally. He is going to conquer the world financially and set up a world order that we have been listening to people talk about down through the ages, a new government, a one world order, and there is going to be a thousand points of light that, that is going to unify us. But you notice that, that that's not the end. That is just the opening of the first seal. The Bible says, beginning in verse number 3, when, I, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people shall kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. It is a time of civil unrest and war. And it happens because the peace plan of the Antichrist just absolutely does not work. People are at war with each other and at war with the Antichrist. No peace plan has ever worked. 
because there is going to be no peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace comes and he sits upon the throne. People search for it. They hunt for it. They desire to have it. You can listen to folks who stand and propagate their peace plans from the, for the world. But ladies and gentlemen, let me assure you that no peace is going to come until the Prince of Peace sets upon the throne of your heart and sets upon the throne of your life. Adrian Rogers, who was the past president of Bellevue, uh, past pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, went out on a visitation program. They went into a very affluent uh, community and they were just knocking on doors, meeting people, trying to, to give some goodwill for the church and, and, and to introduce themselves to the neighborhood. And Adrian was talking to this man and asked him just a personal question. Have you ever received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And that man looked at Adrian Rogers and said, Why do I need Jesus? He said, I have a, a, a job that pays me multiplied millions of dollars. He said, I live in a house where we have four garages. I have automobiles in every one of those garages. He said, I have thousands of square feet of living space. I have enough money to do me and my family for the rest of their lives. I can eat at any restaurant, I own a jet plane, and on and on and on he went. And finally, when he got through giving his grocery list of things that he owned, Adrian Rogers looked at him and said, Sir, I know one thing that you don't have. The man said, what is that? He said, you don't have the peace of God. See, money won't buy the peace of God. Four car garages will not buy the peace of God. Income of millions of dollars will not buy the peace of God. You may be sitting here today looking at a, at a topsy-turvy life that you're living in, wondering how that you can keep your head up above water, and you are searching for just some peace and some rest, let me assure you that the only way you're ever going to find peace is that you're going to find it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. During the days of the Great Tribulation, there will be Antichrist who comes with his great peace plan and unifies the world, but that is only going to be something that is just temporary. No peace is going to come, and the second horse, a fiery red horse, is going to come, and war and calamities are going to come upon this whole world, and, and millions of people are going to die. And then John the Revelator, in verse number 6, sees that third seal as it is opened. And he opened the third seal and heard the living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. There is going to be a black horse that is going to come and he is going to represent the famine that is going to come on this earth. When we think about the great tribulation, sometimes we think about bombs going off. We think about stars falling from heaven. We think about hailstones that weigh almost a hundred pounds. And then we look and see that there is going to be a natural calamity of war, which is famine. In 1945, the Allied forces, the United States in particular, dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. Thousands of people lost their life with that explosion of that atomic bomb. Experts tell us that more people would have died from famine had not the United States and the Allied forces have dropped that bomb and then at the war's end went in to rescue those people. Why is it so? 
while all of the folks that wanted to plant gardens and planting crops are out shooting bullets and are out fighting wars and out flying airplanes. There was no time to, to plant or harvest any crops because of that protracted, extended war. Notice what he said, that the price of a quart of wheat was going to be worth a day's wage. I don't know how much you make, but can you imagine that you would pay a hundred, two hundred dollars for a quart of wheat? Can you imagine the price tag that that would be? Can you imagine the folks that would starve to death? Can you imagine that if there was a great catastrophe or a great calamity in the United States of America, that we only have a food supply for one year. One crop failure would put us on the brink of disaster. No silos filled with grain. There are no storehouses for our food. There is nothing that would keep us from the great famine that is to come. And then in Revelation chapter, 20, excuse me, chapter 6, verse number 7, that fourth seal... When I opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth, the pale horse. And the carnage is so devastating that one-fourth of the world's population was going to die in this particular seal that was unveiled. One-fourth of the population of this world today is one and one-fourth billion people. Can you imagine the carnage? We, we think that it's devastating that a million people lost their lives because of, of, of a horrific flood in China. And yet the devastation that is caused by this pale horse is going to be such that one-fourth of the world's population is going to die. Billion and, and, and a fourth folks are going to die under this one seal. How devastating it is going to be. What is the significance of, of, of this tribulation? What, what is the things that you and I can glean from, from such a depressing opening remark as we have heard today. We know the end is coming. Therefore, be prepared to die. The, the significance is that for the saint of God is that all that stands between a lost person and the judgment seat of Christ is the church, you and I. We can't leave it to Credence Clearwater Revival to share about the great tribulation and the coming wrath of God. We have to get busy because the Bible tells us the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he who wins souls is wise. There is a way that you can, can be a part uh, of God's plan and, and God's program of evangelism through this church. Maybe you're sitting there and say, Brother John, I really have never been trained to be a witness. I, I, I really have never had any courses or study guides that, that would help me. Well, one of the ways that, that you can start is that you can start with a burden on your heart that will cause you to pick up your, your program guide and look at that thing that, that Chris and Richard talk to you about every Sunday morning. That place that says, welcome to our guest. It's easy to find. It is there so that we can have a record of your visit with us. That we can have some contact with you and let you know what is going on at FBC Hayden. We, we have something that would, would, would it help us to identify you. But if you will look on the other side of that card you are going to notice that, that there is a place for, for prayer requests. 
There is someone that, that you may be uh, concerned about, someone that, that is lost without the Lord Jesus Christ, then, then you could just put their name down here and, and put the reason for their request, just fold it up like, like so, and, and then you can slip it to, to myself or to one of the ushers or lay it on the back table back there, and, and, and it will be recorded in, in our office and put on our uh, a prayer list and on every Wednesday night when we gather together, uh, we take these out of that burden box that we have and, and we mention those folks and pray for those folks and they're there and, and maybe we may not remember everyone individually but I want to assure you that God sees your concern and God sees your care and God will remember these that are in our burden box. See, you can be a part of that. Everybody in this room can have uh, an opportunity for evangelism. We understand that the tribulation is significant for us who are saved, but it is also significant to the unsaved. Because it is during this period of time that a living hell will encompass the earth. When a time that the Bible says uh, a great tragedies are, are going to come. Let me finish reading in verse number 12. I looked and behold the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sat cloth of hair and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. And the sky rolled up as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said, to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. We understand that this living hell that will come upon the earth will one day turn into a literal hell where the lost people will be incarcerated. And do not fear those who kill the body and, but cannot destroy the soul, but rather fear Him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. You understand it is a significant time for you because time is now afforded to you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. To make this the day when Jesus Christ becomes your Savior and the Lord of your life. You just, in complete honesty, comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You confess your sins before Him and receive Him as your Savior. The sadness of the tribulation is during that period. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 1 through 11 that they did not repent of their sins. They did not repent of their fornications, of their idolatry, of their sorceries, of all of those pagan things. They did not turn and trust Christ. You can do that today. You can do the will of God before that great tribulation comes. You can come down this aisle and that you can use that as, as a public declaration of your intention to receive Christ as your Savior. Maybe there's other decisions today. Maybe you need to rededicate that life to the Lord and become the soul winner that you need to be. Maybe you need to unite with the church and get busy for the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to come and to identify with Jesus in baptism and His death, His burial, and His resurrection. As God speaks to our heart today, let's be surrendered and submissive his will. Thanks for listening to this message from First Baptist Church Hayden. If you live in the Hayden area, we would love for you to contact us. Let us know how we can minister to you or come by and worship with us. You can find more archived messages along with other helpful information at our website, fbchayden.com. 
As always, we would love to hear how God is working in your life. Please contact us at office at fbchayden.com. We hope you have a blessed day.